I guess we don't mind being hated. Somehow, a 1941 logo at 13 seconds makes it feel like an hour. And what exactly is a radio picture? Just asking. You know the producer's grandiose when his name is in a larger font than the f***ing production company. This looks like a fence that starts as a chain link, goes to some other kind of chain link, then iron at the top, which makes for a strange looking fence. Also, how did these two monkeys end up in the Bengal tiger cage? And how are they not Bengal tiger food yet? This shot is designed to let you know that Kane's house reflects off the water nicely. And also he has two Viking canoes. Rich Guy's castle has a drivable par 4 on hole 16, just so he can feel good about himself toward the end of the round. Rosebud. Kane has an intentionally cryptic name for his the snow globe doesn't break when it falls from the bed, but when it falls from a much shorter distance, it shatters. News on the march! Ah! That totally counts as a jump scare. Newsreel reading. I guess when News on the March found this footage of Xanadu being built, they found the footage that used rear projection fakery that would easily fool these stupid, stupid people from the 40s. Take that, Albert Einstein. The fish of the sea. First of all, that's not a fish, that's an octopus. Second of all, that's not an octopus. It's paper mache and undone wire coat hangers. Xanadu is so big that it can f with the English language with impunity. Charles Foster Kane. Every single article in this newspaper is about Charles Foster Kane. I feel like even if Babe f***ing Ruth died young, the paper would still have something about a robbery or a satanic ritual killing on the front page. Ah, sudden more reading. Also, how many times is this going to switch from text to narration? This is an expositional pretzel. It's nine minutes of expretzelzition. 57 years later. 57 years after 1868, right? Which would put this scene in 1925? If that's the case, then how does this news organization have modern for the time footage of this congressional hearing? And at different angles. Are we still watching the news on the March newsreel, or are we just doing the movie now and no one told me? This McCarthy looking mother is being amplified by nothing because he has no microphone and those speakers behind him are hooked up to nothing. Charles Foster Kane, the evil version of Forrest Gump. First off, even if you have the best intentions, if you're marching at night with torches, it looks like you're either joining a mob to kill a monster or headed to a clan rally. Second, is it the best idea to be carrying open flames next to paper posters? Holy sh! this is the stealthiest news film crew that ever existed. They somehow got into that tree with a camera the size of a human person without anyone noticing and stayed there. All we saw on that screen was that Charles Foster Kane is dead. Actually, that was a pretty exhaustive and somewhat intrusive look at this guy's life for a 10-minute newsreel. When Charles Foster Kane died, he said just one word, Rosebud. Oh, come on. Nobody heard him say that word. He said it in a whisper, and then the nurse came in through a door that was closed. Even if there were some people around with an earshot, the guy said it under his breath. His last dying word. I'd have been the guy who said, what's that, Mr. Kane? Oh, he's dead. All we saw on that screen was a big American. One of the biggest. But how is he any different from Ford? Or Hearst, for that matter, or John Doe? From what I understand, he doesn't differ at all from William Randolph Hearst. Wink, wink. Evocative silhouetted shooting aside, why does no one turn on a light? Having this meeting in the dark is not very practical. Find out about Rosebud. Get in touch with everybody that ever knew him. Oh, who knew him well? Journalist boss makes last words Rosebud important, which in turn makes it important to the audience, even though upon death he could have just been spewing random nonsense birthed from misfiring synapses. Unless you think the movie Science is factual and also, journalists are advised to attempt journalism after inventing the BuzzFeed listicle of newsreels. Orson Welles, in 1941, is about to pan a camera through a neon sign and down into a rain-soaked sunroof window, and my mind is goddamn blown. It's certainly more than your average Hollywood movie does these days. We'll remove a sin for innovation. This is Mr. Thompson, Miss Alexander. He's here late at night during a rainstorm and while you're drunk, so that he can insert something exciting into a newsreel that will one day play for excited audiences about to watch Cat People. Did you ever say anything about Rosebud? As a matter of fact, uh... Just the other day, when the papers were full of it, I asked her, never heard of Rosebud. This guy is an asshole to start a sentence with this much hope, only to say she's never heard of Rosebud. He already paid him, why the hell is he dragging this out? You will confine yourself, it is our understanding, to the chapters in Mr. Thatcher's manuscript regarding Mr. Kane. Why the hell would you trust a reporter to just focus on a certain number of pages without closely monitoring him? Were the scruples of reporters higher in 1941? Snowman here, no snowman here. Will you Charles. Mama Kane is worried about Charles staying warm while she has a giant window open letting all the cold in. While this guy bitches about not getting enough money for young Charles, we can clearly see young Charles outside playing, not a care in the world. And this is praiseworthy character development direction even today. Bank's decision on all matters I don't hold with signing my boy away to any bank. You know, even if he's an asshole father, Kane Sr. has a point here. How the hell does Mrs. Kane get away with signing over Charlie without the father's consent, no matter what the hell the bank says? And are you telling me every time the bank needs to discipline this child, they'll need to call a board meeting? I've got his trunk all packed. I've had it packed for a week now. So did Charles just wear the same sh for a week? To properly escape this situation, Charlie runs back to the adults and takes a swan dive into the snow. As well as the assumption by you of full responsibility for the world's sixth largest private fortune. Who writes an official document decreeing that someone's fortune is the sixth largest? Hey guys, make sure you see how his fortune ranks against the other fortunes before giving him control of it. You'll need to know there are five people richer than him. I think it would be fun to run a newspaper. <sighs> Fourth wall breaking. Hilarious, but still a sit. Every single motherfucker on this train is a male who's reading the same newspaper. Seriously? Where are all the white women at? Thatcher prefers to read his paper in a new place every day. Robert, Robert, 
galleons of Spain off Jersey coast. How many people get the Enquirer and audibly exclaim its headlines out loud? By this movie's count, a lot. Continue to maintain over your newspapers a large measure of control. Even though the stock market crash caused Kane to sell most of his newspaper empire to Thatcher, Thatcher still allows him to maintain a measure of control. Because in his old age, he forgot about the yellow journalism crusade that Kane ran against him. We never lost as much as we made. So that's making a profit. But he just said, I did lose a million dollars last year. I expect to lose a million dollars this year. Oh yeah, I forgot that what we were watching was being read from this unpublished Thatcher memoir. 59 pages of which apparently included a symbolic passage of time as a sled got covered with snow. That also completely neglected Kane's formative years and somehow cast him as the protagonist of Thatcher's own memoir. Hey you, no skipping to page 128 or so help me God. Bernstein thought it best to stack up all his belongings in the doorway to be able to make this dramatic entrance. The news goes on for 24 hours a day. The movie predicts the prevalence of cable news, 75 five years ago, and is thus eerily prescient, but I'm sinning it for being somewhat responsible for cable news. Man, this newsie has some balls to be peddling the Chronicle right outside the door of the Enquirer. With a daily paper that will tell all the news honestly. Scenes like this were made to destroy cinema sense, because we're just that arrogant. This lighting is impossible, but the fact that our protagonist is saying something completely dishonest, but seems to believe what he's saying, while draped in shadow, is something I could callously give a sin for, or I could just remove a sin, so I will. In 1941, New York City had nearly 8 million inhabitants, so this newspaper has basically, like, 0.3% of the population reading it, and that may be enough to stay in business, but it's nowhere near the level this movie would have you believe. Look who's working for the Chronicle. With them fellas, it's no trick to get circulation. You're right, Mr. Bernstein. Somehow, Kane managed to take the same picture six years later, all looking the same age and got them in exactly the same outfits, chairs, facial hair, and poses without making one mistake, and even got that same wooden frame in the background. Six years later, I got my candy. All of it. <laughs> Welcome, gentlemen, to the Inquirer. Wait, it took Kane six years to get the staff to transfer to the Inquirer? but they all left on the same day? That's like the entire starting lineup for the Yankees defecting to the Red Sox overnight. These guys merely see some women and all penis breaks loose. Who is this one? Who is this one? His favorite son! His favorite son! Putting the chorus girl who doesn't know the choreography right up front. If he was in this much of a hurry, why'd he come upstairs in the first place? He could have more easily sent someone to deliver the note, so he didn't have to run upstairs and then awkwardly run out. Even though Leland's memory is total bullshit, and there's no way he knew all this stuff, you gotta love the way Wells does this scene of a crumbling marriage, even showing his wife reading the rival newspaper. It's worthy of at least one cent off. First off, what was the wealthy Kane doing standing on a street corner, right by a mud puddle, looking directly at the street? Second, there is no way the tiny wheels of that horse-drawn carriage would be able to produce the amount of splash to cover Kane from head to toe. Also, give me the drug she's on for her toothache. She really thinks Kane's suit getting messed up is that hilarious. Also, she came out of that pharmacy on the corner, he's right there getting splashed, and she then just happens to literally live next door to the pharmacy? That's nuts! I just want to take a moment and remind everyone that Leland is telling Thompson all this, which would mean that Leland, even in his old age, has extremely detailed recollections of moments he didn't witness. Oh, don't tell me a toothache is still bothering you. Oh no, that's all gone. The toothache that required you to go to the drugstore and that briefly prevented you from being able to communicate? Don't give me that BS about laughter being the best medicine. Oh, be mine? This goes on for some time. The downright villainy of Boss Jim W. Gettys! Hey, um, where's his microphone? You don't mean to say that he's audible to all these people on diaphragm control and good projection alone, do you? I made no campaign promises. Yeah, but you still have to have a platform, right? I mean, you can't expect an audience in 2016 to believe you can run for a major political office without any clear ideas, just relying on brand recognition. Where are you going? I'm going to 185 West 74th Street. Because I always investigate random anonymous notes about my husband's alleged infidelity at the drop of a hat. I'm Jim Geddes. This guy has been running for governor for quite a while, and he's been the primary antagonist for the Canes throughout the campaign. Do they not already know who he is? Geddes! I'm going to send you to Sig Sig! And I'm going to pull off the best ventriloquist act this world has ever seen. And the church count is still to be heard from. I'm afraid we've got no choice. This one? I don't quite understand what Kane thinks he can get away with at this point. As a candidate, his involvement with the Inquirer should be well known. Therefore, so should the Inquirer's bias. He might as well print a headline that says Jim W. Gettys is a doo-doo head. He lost, but the Kane headquarters still set off a bunch of streamers at some point tonight. For some reason. Maybe they're all just happy they don't have to work for that asshole anymore. This is more camera greatness. They cut holes in the floor. Imagine that. We'll remove three sins for not only the camera work, but the scene itself. Also, is that a spittoon? F***ing olden times, man. 1940s YouTube commenters. Look, I know it's 1941 and bald cap technology has come a long way, but did this have to happen? I mean, Bernstein's old man makeup looks fine. Just let him keep his hair. Jed should have QWERTY as defix imprinted on his face after sleeping that long. This guy just sat here for God knows how long until this drunk asshole woke up. Everybody knows that story, Mr. Leland. But you didn't stop him from telling it, causing all of us to sit through 30 minutes of flashback that doesn't get any closer to knowing what Rosebud is. You know what the headline was the day before the election? Candidate Kane found in love nest with... 
quote, singer, unquote. He was going to take the quotes off the singer. Yeah, but wasn't that the Chronicle reporting that story? He didn't know in that paper, did he? Because movie is showing off its multiple perspectives and sometimes stories overlap, it makes me watch what I saw five minutes ago, but from a different perspective. Thanks, Art. Movie unintentionally inspires an overused internet gif, which it should totally have known it would do back in 1941. I don't propose to have myself made ridiculous. You don't propose to have yourself made ridiculous? What about me? You know, I know she's supposed to be at least a little annoying, and that's her character and everything, but Jesus. Is this the fourth newspaper montage or fifth? I've lost count. How the hell did they get into this locked door without breaking it down? Ah, sweaty white face of terror. You know, for a movie that started with an audacious description of Xanadu, this movie doesn't really Xanadu that much. Without knowing you at all, if you build or live in a house with a fireplace you can f***ing stand in, you're an asshole. How about that? Citizen Kane is the movie that pioneered the evil tailgating black SUV convoy cliche. Who knew? This seems like a nice night for a picnic. Mild weather, shady trees, cartoon birds flying in the background. Is this their permanent tent? Or did they make the staff bring out furniture, trunks filled with books, a radio, and a typewriter? I wouldn't put it past them. It just seems extremely unnecessary to bring all this stuff out there for just one night. You never gave me anything in your whole life! Susan's basically complaining that Kane never gave her him, the guy who magically cured her toothache with shadow puppets that one night. But she decides to tell Kane in this ironic screenwriter speak so that he'll never get the point. And all we hear and he hears is I'm an ungrateful spoiled brat who ignores all the wealth, the singing lessons, the manufactured newspaper headlines, and the unlimited supply of jigsaw puzzles you gave me. Susan! Wow, this musical choice is decidedly on the nose. The next song they'll play is Rosebud is a Sled. <laughs> While this marital discord plays out, a woman is casually murdered off screen. Rosebud? Oh yeah, I remember Rosebud, the narrative device that drove the plot but hasn't been mentioned in over an hour. I'm shocked we don't call MacGuffins Rosebuds. I tell you about Rosebud. How much is it worth to you? Thousand dollars? Okay. A thousand dollars in 1941? How the f*** does Thompson have the authority to approve this? Like the time his wife left. <sighs> What the f*** was that? No, seriously, what the f*** was that? Is that screeching bird supposed to be Susan Alexander? Because that's kind of racist and woke me up from my nap. AFI's number one movie of all time unintentionally inspires The Room, and this goes on for some time. Rosebud. God damn it, I'm calling bullshit on this snow globe made me remember the name of my sled scene. This is like me losing my Transformer collection as a kid and saying Hasbro on my deathbed. Kane has this infinity mirror installed because he knew there would be a moment in his life that called for symbolic imagery, as told to a stranger by his butler. However, Jesus, that shot is pure brilliance. It's good for at least a couple sins off. And that's what you know about Rosebud? Yeah. I I heard him say it that other time, too. No, you didn't. Talk about being committed to getting the perfect shot. This guy is defiling this statue with his crotch to capture these statues at the perfect vantage point. Hey, remember how Kane's collection was... So big it can never be catalogued or appraised. Then what do these jokers think they're doing? News on the march is garbage. Rosebud, did you ever find out what it means? No, I didn't. What did you find out about him, Jerry? Not much, really. God damn it, Jerry. They sent you on a mission to find the meaning of Rosebud, and who Kane really was, and this is what you come back with? What are they going to do with this, Jerry? Call the narration guy back in to say, What do we really know about who he was? Not much. And what of his last words? Rosebud, do we know its true meaning? No. Also, if I were news on the march, I'd look closely at Jerry's expense reports, if you get my drift. Mr. Kane was a man who got everything he wanted and then lost it. This is basically a too long didn't read for the whole movie. Oh, so Rosebud was the sled he had as a kid. You know what? Kane was still a total asshole. I'm not sure his forlorn childlike wishes make up for 70 years of dickishness. I'm kind of glad his sled was never recovered and is now burning. It makes me, the viewer, feel the world at large is more balanced and fair. F*** you, Charles Foster Kane. You were a total prick. Seems to me you got what you deserved. A few things. None of the workers deciding to throw the stuff away heard anyone mention Kane's last words, even though it's been the only thing anyone has talked about since he died. If they had heard it, they would have seen the sled and went, Hey, look, the sled says Rosebud. This is what he was talking about. Also, his mom kept the sled? Huh, guess they haven't elected a new pope yet. Stuff about the cast reading. Ever since CinemaSins began, the most requested thing has been TV Sins, and now it's a reality. <gasps> Click the link in the description below to check it out. And now, the audio outtakes. Of grocery stores, paper mills, apartment buildings, factories, forests, ocean liners. On the lambs and sloths and carp and anchovies and orangutans and breakfast cereals and fruit bats. And... That was a great number. I don't care what you say. I thought it was dumb. <laughs> Maybe you're right. My opponent would rather protect bureaucrats 
than serve American children. And that's what she's doing, and that's what she's done. Death came to Charles Foster Kane. You, on the mark. It's Nike's ball. And I swear it's Springfield's only choice. Throw up your hands and raise your voice. Monterey. What's it called? Monterey. Once again. Monterey. I have summoned you here for a purpose. Nobody summons Megatron. Then it pleases me to be the first. Candy Mountain, Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. We're going to Candy Mountain. Come with us, Charlie.